Yes, yeah, so why are we talking about model complexity? So one of the reasons we talked about model complexity is uh, because we wanted to derive those guarantees on our number, number of training samples. Um, but there's other reasons that are more practical is that model, model complexity it leads to general, is linked to generalization. So we're going to see that. So we've seen until now a very nice example when the blue points were really nicely fitting inside a rectangle and all the orange points were nicely outside this rectangle. Um, what's <coughs> going to happen in real life is that you're going to have noise in your data or you're not going to have exactly the right features or a combination of both. And in the end, you're going to end up with some orange points that gets in the middle of your blue points and conversely. Uh, so I've said, you know, uh, measurement errors. Uh, so this is imprecision in recording the features. I've said sometimes you don't record the right features. Uh, so uh, because you don't know what are the right features. I mean, here we've chosen a simple example. But if I'm trying to predict cancer from the genome of a patient, I have no idea. And well, I have some idea of what are the features I should take, but I don't know for sure that they are the right ones and that I am measuring the right things. Um, so we often talked about hidden or latent variables, which are the true variables that explain at the same time the label, so say whether someone has cancer, and the features you measure. So the fact that they have this gene very expressed. But the link might not be direct, and which is why you have some fuzziness that appears. Uh, you can also have errors in labeling the data points. So someone uh, says this person didn't have cancer, but it turns out that two months later, this person uh, declared a cancer. Uh, mm -hmm. Then it, this person should have been labeled positive, but we didn't know that at the time. Um, this is called teacher noise uh, because of this uh, underlying idea is that giving data to the system is being the teacher, uh, and teachers make mistakes. Um, right. So now, what do we do when we have this data with the noise? We can stick to making rectangles, or we can try to find a shape, a badly hand-drawn shape, that really has all the blue points inside and all the orange points outside. So you tend, or at least the person sitting in front of me, tends to prefer simpler model, models. Uh, that's what we try to do in general for many, many reasons. The first one is that they are easier to use and to train and to explain. That was already a lot of reasons. Uh, but it's much easier to encode this rectangle and to use this rectangle to separate to know whether a point is inside or outside then to draw this line, which I did poorly, and to then have the computer decide whether a point is inside or outside that line. Um, and also it's much easier to say, well I labeled this as a family car because its price was between this and that and its power was between this and that than to tell someone I labeled it because it fell within this really shaped thing. Uh, think again uh, of the bioinformatics examples I was mentioning earlier. Uh, clinicians would rather say this is uh, a breast cancer that is not going to fall in remission, so, sorry, that is not going to have uh, I'm losing my words. Anyway, you're not going to have a secondary tumor happening. Uh, you'd rather say that based on because this gene is not expressed and this gene is expressed, and we know that when this is the case, generally no secondary tumor happens, rather than having something that says, well, it's within the weirdly shaped purple thing, so it's probably not going to declare a secondary tumor. The reason people want to predict whether someone declares a secondary tumor or not is because if you do, uh, so in particular in breast cancer, so Institut Curie is mostly, was one of the big things at Curie is breast cancer. Um, so if you do surgery to remove a tumor, uh, if you think 
So there's very little chances that the secondary tumor appears, you stop at surgery. If you think there's high chances that a secondary tumor appears, then you follow that with chemotherapy. Uh, and people want, usually want to avoid having chemotherapy if they can. Um, all right. So that was those three points covered. And there, this all goes towards one end, which is that they generalize better. So they explain new data better. Why, based on the principle that's called Occam's razor, uh, you can read about the story of Occam uh, on probably Wikipedia, uh, who was, I think he was a monk, but whatever. There's something linked to a monk uh, and Occam's razor, but which basically says that simpler explanations are more plausible. So, and this was the intuition of your colleague here who was saying, I like the rectangle better than the weirdly shaped purple thing. Okay. Um, so this is linked to something that we call overfitting. Uh, this is uh, actually in your textbook. And so maybe you don't see very well, but you have here a black classifier, which is this complex shape. And you have a blue classifier, which is a purple, sorry, classifier, which is this dotted <coughs> line, which is much smoother here. Uh, so I phrased this, a bit, phrased this a bit weirdly, but which one of those two is making more errors on the training set? The purple one. So the black one is following the data closely and there's no mistakes. Uh, the purple one is not, so it makes mistakes. But which one do you like best? I know you like the purple one best. <laughs> um, okay, and so we call this, so we think this black model is unlikely to be realistic because it's too complicated compared to the dimension of the space. Uh, and <coughs> it's fitting very closely to the data and we call this overfitting. So overfitting is this, what occurs when your model uh, is very good on your training data. So here the black model is perfect with the training data, but it generalizes poorly uh, to new data because actually the purple explanation was better and for a new data point, I mean those two are kind of close to each other, but if I put a new data point, data point here, uh, it's actually going to be better classified by the purple one, sorry here, than the, by the purple one than by the black one. I could also decide that I only want to use a line and then I would draw a line here, and I would make many, many mistakes. Uh, in that case, I would barely pay attention to my data and the shape it has, <coughs> and I would barely fit to it, so we would call that underfitting. So coming back to our hypothesis space, and uh, hypothesis in classes, essentially overfitting is what happens when your hypothesis space is more complex than the true class, and underfitting is what happens when your hypothesis space is less complex than the true class. So if your true class is a rectangle and you take a line, this is less complex, remember the VC uh, uh, dimension, we say the VC dimension of a line was lower than that of a rectangle. So, I mean, I think you don't need me to compute VC dimensions to see that a line is less complex than a rectangle. Um, so if you use a line, you're going to underfit. On the other hand, if you use a complex uh, hand-drawn shape, as I was doing before, uh, this is going to be more complex. It comes from a space that's more complex than the space of rectangles, <coughs> and there's a risk of overfitting. Uh, of course, it's really hard to know whether you're overfitting or underfitting or fitting properly, because you never know C, because if you knew C, you would need to do learning. Uh, but we'll see in particular uh, on Friday when we look at module evaluation uh, how uh, this, uh, how you can empirically try to evaluate those things. So one other way to look at it is the so-called bias variance trade-off. Um, so if you've done a little bit of statistics, you've learned about the bias and variance of estimators. Uh, so the so bias is how far your uh, 
estimator is far from the mean of the distribution that you're trying to uh, estimate, and the variance is how widely this varies. Um, so, in other words, the bias of your estimator is this um, expected value of the difference between the estimator and, uh, and the true value. Uh, so a simpler model uh, will have higher biases because you'll be far from the mean. On the other hand, a uh, more complex model will have, so they, you might find the mean exactly, so this is what it's meant to have no error on the training set. Uh, but then your variance, which is this quantity, uh, will be higher. So, I mean, if you look at the models, this black line that was shattered all over, uh, separating the blue points from the uh, orange points, had a higher variance. It had a higher variability, at least in uh, intuitive terms, uh, than the smoother purple line. Um, <coughs> Okay, and you can actually decompose the mean squared error, so the empirical error uh, between your uh, your train set and the actual, well, your predicted and actual labels uh, as a decomposition <coughs> between the, var the variance and the bias. And so what this means is that there's no free lunch. Uh, if you have a low bias, you have a high bar <laughs> you'll have a high variance. If you have a high var a low variance, you'll have a high bias. Uh, so you'll have to find the right uh, trade-off between both. Again, I told you that complex models were fitting the training data very well, but not applying very well to uh, a new data. And this is an important diagram to remember. So if you increase your model complexity, uh, your error on the training data will get lower. So uh, this was this, what this whole overfitting was about, was about. And so you'll get towards a high variance but low bias. On the other hand, on new data, so of course, if you start increasing your model complexity, so you move from a line to a rectangle to explain the data we've been working on at the beginning, the family car data, uh, of course, getting a rectangle is going to lower your error. <coughs> But then at some point, you'll do things that are more complicated, and when you'll see a new data point, you'll make more and more mistakes about it. Um, so you see that uh, the, what you're interested in is, of course, the prediction error on new data. You already know the labels on, the, on your training data. So a lot of what we'll be doing is trying to find this point here, where your model is uh, <laughs> complex enough that it explains new data well, but not so complex that it actually only works on the training data. Um, I have a few more slides because we've been talking only about binary classification. This is not the only type of supervised learning problem we've been looking at. And let's first start with multiple classes classification. Ma imagine now we're still looking at cars. Uh, we we'll have we have their price and their power still, but now we have uh, three categories. We have family cars, luxury cars, and sports cars. So that's usually the way we cast multi-class multi -class problem, classification problems, is that instead of having one classification problem, we have three classification problems here. Right? We have three classes. Uh, so more uh, formally, we have k classes, so here k equals 3, and then we have uh, k labels. So now, uh, so remember, uh, the exponent uh, indicates uh, which training example we're talking about. And now we have an index that tells about which class we're talking about. And then now y is binary. So you say, uh, for so if uh, k equals 1 corresponds to family cars, we say we're trying to separate family cars from all the other cars. So we label those things as positives and all these other things as negatives. And then we do this for k equals two sports cars. Sports cars are positives, those are negative. And then for k equals three, luxury sedans. So now we have three problems that are of course related to each other. And now we have three hypotheses. So here with this an example, we can still use <coughs> rectangles as hypotheses. 
you usually try to use the same family of hypotheses, the same hypothesis space for all your classes, but it's not necessarily the case. When you separate family across from the rest, it's going to be part of the luxury sedans when you separate the luxury sedans from the rest. And of course, I mean, there's a question of how you, uh, um, how you assign your final label. So if I get a new point and several of those hypotheses say it belongs to this class, so then if you're in the example you were saying and you allow this to happen, then a point that would be here would be a family luxury car. Um, if you don't know this, you need a way to make a final decision and say, well, I can't have something that's a family luxury car, so I need uh, some extra machinery on top of that to make my final decision. So if you have a confidence attached with your prediction, for instance, that helps a lot. Um, more questions about multiple classes? Okay, um, so the so last uh, class of uh, supervised learning problems we've talked about and we're going to talk about is regression. Uh, so again, we're trying to predict not a class but a continuous value. Um, so here, uh, x is in that drawing one-dimensional. So we have points that are, that are sorry, those small points uh, here that I'm not sure you see in the back, but uh, there are a few points here. Um, and uh, so you're learning a function of a particular shape that you have to define. So now your hypothesis space is what is the shape of this function. So for instance, I can decide this uh, function is a line, and then I'm doing linear regression. Uh, and uh, you can measure the error as the uh, mean squared error. So uh, for each data point, you compute the difference between uh, the true value and the one you predicted, and then you square it so that everything is positive, and then you add all those things, and probably you average them because you don't want to have a bigger error just because you have more points. Um, and then again, the complexity of the model allow you to fit different shapes. So different, depending on the complexity you decide on, you can fit a line or a, pol or a polynomial of degree two or a polynomial of a higher degree uh, to your function or other sorts of shapes. So we'll see more about this uh, in this lecture. Although we'll talk mostly about classification and then just extend this to regression uh, <laughs> in some ways, but uh, some of the methods we'll see are more regression. Uh, so all the linear and logistic regressions, for instance, you do them for regression problems and then you show how you can extend them to classification problems. For some other things, we'll do it the other way around, but there's always, uh, once you find a way to uh, fit data in one setting, you usually find a way to extend it to the other setting. Um, okay, so we still have this problem of under and overfitting. Uh, so now it's uh, instead of having, of wanting to separate <coughs> blue points from uh, orange points, I want to fit a line or a curve to my points. And then here, so the black line is a real line, and then there's been some measurement error. Uh, and then I can choose to fit a very simple model that's going to fail most of the time and do many <coughs> mistakes. Or I can do a model that fits the data better. It has lots of weird peaks, uh, and this is most likely to overfit. So it's exactly the same concept as when this curve was separating points from one class and the other. Um, okay. So... Um, to conclude, I wanted to attract your attention to the fact that we're constantly interesting, interested in three different aspects of a supervised learner. So the first one, so the first thing is, I'll repeat it, I've said it before, I'll say it again, we're always considering that our uh, samples in the training set are independent from one another. Um, 
So IID means indep independent and identically distributed. So you assume they come from the same underlying distribution that you don't know and that they are independent. Uh, they've been drawn independently from one another. Um, we want to build a model that explains this data and the labels we're observing. So there's three aspects to that. The first one is the model, the shape of the model, so which is the class of hypothesis. So is it going to be a rectangle, a circle, a wedge shape? Um, then there's how do I measure the error? So, so far I've told you uh, we count the number of points that are misclassified or we, count, or we look at uh, the uh, mean squared error, so the sum of distances between uh, training points and, uh, sorry, between the true label, the true label of the, ten, of the training points and their uh, predicted labels. Uh, but we'll see that there are many, many ways to define errors depending on the applications. And then, of course, there's the optimization procedures that you use uh, to uh, fit the model to the data. And the way you fit the model to the data, so you decide which are the parameters of this model, uh, is by minimizing the error. And this is what we'll talk about during... Uh, most of the coming lectures. <laughs>